कि वो इसके उपलक्ष में दो शब्द कहें और प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस का विधिवत आगाज करें आदरणीय Good afternoon, everybody. All those who are present here in the conference hall with us now, and many more who are connected with us online, I welcome you all to today's media briefing. Dear friends, as you are all aware. the draft science technology and innovation policy which is popularly known as stip has been released in the new year on 1st january many of you have written about it as well however uh, a need has been felt for a deeper interaction with media on this policy the government has always considered media as a critical partner in any policy or program formulation it has been because of your thought provoking analysis on various issues but also because of your ability to generate feedback by highlighting ground realities from the grassroots onwards this feedback is essential as it provides valuable inputs to make any policy or program realistic and effective this media briefing on the draft science technology and innovation policy has been arranged with the same purpose so without taking much time uh, we will start with the proceedings i welcome secretary department of science and technology professor ashutosh sharma and head of the stips tech secretary dr akhilesh gupta who will be uh, briefing about the policy in detail i will also give a quick structure of the briefing first secretary professor ashutosh sharma will give an overview of the policy then there will be a detailed presentation by dr akhilesh gupta after that it will be followed by the question and answer session so now i hand over the dice to the professor professor uh indeed uh, a very good morning to all a very happy new year i'm so happy to see all the old friends uh, again being here physically we are able to meet now we have been through nearly 10 months uh, of trying times and i'm so glad to see that we are all uh, you know come out of it and there is uh, vaccines as around the corner so there is light at the end of the tunnel i just want to tell you very quickly that this entire policy formulation happened Uh, during the covid-19 times much of it happened in the last 6 uh, months and this was not a small thing because the amount of cons- consultations that happened for making the policy uh, it is really unprecedented for a policy in science technology and innovation so my colleague um, uh, dr akhilesh gupta would tell us the process by which uh, policy was made uh indeed with lot of energy and enthusiasm and very wide uh, stakeholder consultations because we should remember that science and technology is is not only for scientists it is for everyone that science technology impacts so one would need to have these very wide consultations from school students to um a uh, very uh, deep scientist very senior scientist young people young scientist phd students college students uh, farmers uh, women living in small places um uh, states uh, a very important aspect is to connect with the states who are little bit been historically little weaker in science and technology uh connecting with diaspora connecting with our international partners to embassies and uh, uh the the bilateral uh, partners uh, which are international uh, so a very very comprehensive road map indeed and we would learn more about it now i would just very quickly tell you an overview of why we needed a new policy in science technology and innovation what is what what is the need for it now um uh, 
So one thing is uh, we realize that science and technology and innovation is the strongest foundation on which our future will be built. So even after COVID-19 has disappeared from the margins of history books, our overarching challenges for the entire humanity will be solved, addressed only by science and technology. And these challenges are, were the challenges which were not clear even 10 years ago. So this is the reason, uh, one of the reasons as to why we need a policy now. To give you an example, uh, the rise of intelligent machines, uh, for example, artificial intelligence, machine learning, industry 4.0, society 5.0, how science connects with society, um, uh, robotics, autonomous uh, vehicles, all of this uh, universe of intelligent machines, nobody had thought about them and their impact on everything we do 10 years ago. Similarly, there are so many disruptive exponential technologies on the horizon that we have to be fully prepared for. These are, for example, quantum uh, technologies, quantum communication, quantum computing, quantum devices, algorithms. Uh, if we are not totally master uh, of these technologies in the years to come, we would have to pay a very high price for it. So this is one aspect of policy. Uh, uh, there are challenges like sustainable development, climate change, uh, rise of antimicrobial resistance, all the health uh, ideas that have, you know, we realize them to the COVID-19 challenges. Um, the environment, clean energy, water, all of these things were not coming at us, uh, you know, in such a compelling way 10 years ago as they do now. The roadmap and the vision for that have to be extremely clear, totally clear. Um, here is um, where the future is coming at us at ever faster rate. Uh, ever faster, which was unimagined, uh, I, I would say. I would not have imagined it 10 years ago as to the challenges, which also bring opportunities. At the same time, if we look at the rise of innovation and startups, which is another area which again was not so well imagined as a driver, as an engine of growth uh, for the nation as it has become now. So we suddenly need policy that would totally empower uh, our innovation sector. So essentially another aspect of this policy, an overarching aspect, is, 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 is connecting our invention and innovation ecosystems. So while our invention ecosystem like universities, IITs, R&D labs are working well, even historically, it's not so well connected with the use of knowledge. So while we can create knowledge, we are very good at creating knowledge. Uh, India is number three in number of scientific publications, which is an indicator that we are good at creating knowledge. Now what we need is a relevance, quality and direction for this knowledge. And we need a connect of this knowledge with the people who would use it. Uh, for example, industry, for example, government, for example, startups, for example, NGOs, anyone, all of us who are here, uh, so it is about democratizing knowledge, it is about having access to knowledge and it is about disseminating this knowledge as well. And which is why science communication for which we are here today plays a very important role. So which is a very uh, you know, new uh, component in the policy. How do we bring science, scientists and uh, the journalist actually together to be uh, a co-owner uh, of science, technology and innovation if you would. This is extremely important because it is through democrat democratization which means access to, to knowledge and access to all other resources like infrastructure. Like say we have a very good access to what we have uh, to all the people who can make use of it then basically we are making strong connections and we are making full use uh, of what we have and what we would continue to build. Now, democratization and diversity, which means inclusion, 
uh, should become the engines of uh, development. And so that's another aspect in the policy, which is saying, look, you, you cannot run on a single wheel. Uh, a single wheel will deliver that much power uh, to a locomotive, but it's best when all the wheels are working together. So what are these wheels? These are certainly about inclusion in gender. Uh, this is inclusion and empowerment of young people. We have a demographic dividend now. I mean, there's, you know, young people, energetic people, educated people, aspiring people, but they need to have participation, opportunity and empowerment so that a young, uh, you know, uh, young can bring new ideas and new energy into the way we do things. Uh, so it's about inclusion, equity, diversity, empowerment of all the different sections that would make uh, it possible uh, for us to do 100% science, technology uh, and innovation. So um, I think if, you, if I were to actually just describe uh, the essence of this policy in one or two sentences, what is it aims to do? It aims to basically create an end-to-end -end science, technology, and innovation ecosystem, which is inclusive, which is empowered, which would allow us to do relevant and quality science, technology, and innovation, which would permeate every aspect of society. And in fact, we are starting right here uh, you know, so we all of us are actually stakeholders, equal stakeholders in this process, uh, which is to take science, to take knowledge, to every section which uh, needs it, which wants it, and which would benefit uh, by it. So I, I want to thank all, all, all of us, all of you who are here, who made it, uh, you know, despite all this stuff going on now. Uh, so it is great actually to be together once in a while physically. And I'm so glad we are here together. Uh, I would now um, request uh, Dr. Akhilesh Gupta to make a tight, brief uh, presentation on the key aspects of the policy uh, that, um, that is in the draft. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, Professor Ashutosh Sharma, Secretary DST, uh, Mrs. Nanu Vaseen, DADG, PID, uh, all distinguished uh, uh, journalists and other correspondents uh, who have come from uh, various agencies, officers of PID and DST. Uh, well, I think I have a, a job to do in 20 minutes. Uh, I got slides that need to be finished. So I will try to be very fast in in, in, in uh, uh, designing through these slides and maybe later on we can have questions uh, uh, from these slides. So, uh, so this, in fact, I think uh, since the Secretary DC has already given some referencing of the policy, I, uh, this will help me skipping some of the uh, slides here. So, as you know, there are uh, you know four science policies that have come up in the past, and all these policies came at different circumstances, at different times, uh, and therefore uh, one cannot be compared to the because you know they were, they were relevant at the time they were brought. Uh, all these policies have impacted the action by the government uh, after they were released. So I will leave it here because there could be some question, you know, like what happened after say 58 policy, HHC, 2003 and 13, I think uh, largely known to everybody, but all of them made impact when they were uh, released. Uh, I think this slide I will skip because Secretary has already mentioned why we need policy when we had last policy in 2013 we said why what happened in the last seven years that we needed a new policy i am going to skip this but i already said similarly the unprecedented 
progress that STI in India has achieved uh, and made is also very noteworthy. We have become in top three in many of the elements, many of the areas, but you know, uh, it, this needed, I mean, if you look at, there are gray areas where we are lagging. Uh, you know, for example, in the World Innovation Index, we are uh, at the 48th number. Also, in terms of quality, we are still at, you know, at number 11 uh, and, and so on. So, therefore, uh, you know, we uh, have certain areas where we need to work on C. This policy is somewhat differently formulated as compared to all other policies. And this is very distinct, uh, distinctly came up, you know, when we did uh, policy formulation. This is unlike other policies which were largely taught driven. This policy was made bottom up right from this, uh, you know, starting time. And this uh, we plan working for the population. Also, it was decentralized in the sense we included a stakeholder at the at different decentralized level. For example, the states were concerned, were consulted, or the ministries were consulted. Also, this policy is uh, evidence driven and uh, a knowledge based policy, and also the inclusiveness. Of in terms of age, in terms of you know uh, the people of different region, including the gender, all were ensured uh, through this policy. This is the first time, and I'm telling you this because we have surveyed the entire world uh, policy how they were uh, formulated. This is a unique formulation process that we put in place, not done anywhere in the world. Track one, track four process where we saw how we can involve all the stakeholders. I'm not going to detail, but I'll say under track 3 process, this is again first time as Shikki mentioned, state government was consulted. Never for any policy, we, uh, the state government was Similarly, never for any policy, uh, you know, the uh, diaspora people were consulted. These are two unique features of, uh, you know, consultation that we had. Uh, if you look at the process that as Tekki mentioned, the entire process was completed in a period of one year. This is another unique feature of the thing. We started, uh, in fact, actually the formulation process started in January 2020, but at the actual kickoff was in, in the month of May June. And so May to now, in the past six months or so, we have completed the entire process in the winter record time. A large number of stakeholders, you look at these, you know, we had research students, young scientists, the state government, the uh, academic institutions, and so on. So, the range of stakeholders consulted has been almost, you know, uh, we didn't leave. So, not a single type or category of stakeholder we left out. Uh, if you look at the entire consultation process in summary, we had 300 rounds of consultation, 300 plus. So beginning from the process in May to now 300 rounds of so literally every day two meetings minimum, and including Saturday, Sunday we had, and we in fact one on one, 9,000 people were consulted, but extended early consultation, three, sorry, 4,000 to total. 43,000 people were consulted in the last six months. 90,000 participated in the quiz that we put it on the website, on the uh, GOV uh, you know, website. And uh, nearly one lakh ideas or suggestions came through email. Uh, so this is the largest, widest, quickest, and the most intense process that we have followed. Another important thing is that even at the formulation stage, the women participation has been showed. We had put together all the committee, 30 to 40 percent representation of women scientists and other stakeholders. Even in the, um, uh, all this, uh, the panel discussion that we organized, we ensured that there should be equity maintained into the thing. 
also we had focused on young as well as the old world. The youngest participant was something like you know 10 year old boy and the oldest was 85 years person. So which means range of you know people not just in terms of just, uh, you know type and but also age wise. This policy I am I'm, I'm going to give a glimpse of what it contains but this is a policy which actually gives it, it has uh, you know, uh, food for everyone. There are more than 100 top ideas in the entire policy. If you read, you will know what the top ideas are. I'm going to present only some top ideas that we have. There are 11 chapters in the entire policy. And uh, so uh, let me uh, come one by one. So in the open science, as Sekhti mentioned, is open science is a I think it has been debated extensively at different fora, and worldwide the uh, you know the discussion going on. UNESCO in several of the their commission meetings had discussed that there should be a global open science uh, available, and this policy brings something very very I would say uh, you know uh, out of this uh, uh, normal thinking. For example, we have brought a concept of a, a national STI observatory. Although there are observatories, there are portals available in the country at different domains, what we want here that there should be a one-stop shop for everybody. All the data that is generated from the government-supported uh, funding, uh, government-supported projects should be put so all data, resources, knowledge, everything. So it's one stop shop will be the national audience. As a part of this, we'll have a portal, which is called Insta, Insta, and then uh, also we will have, so this is this has both input and output mechanism where the inputs are, out, outputs are in terms of availability of the data and access and, and also in terms of uh, input where all researchers are supposed to deposit their, uh, you know, uh, you know, research papers or preprints with the with the authority. Of course, such a thing are in, in some form already exist. Uh, in say UDC has set up a, a portal like this, but this is much more inclusive and very very, uh, you know, intense in that. Also, we have this great idea of one nation, one subscription. I, I would elaborate and I will take question on this, but this is an, again a very, uh, I would say, uh, a unique uh, uh, you know, initiative where uh, right now in all institutions in the country are paying for suspicion of the journals. Uh, there are top you know, publications <coughs> like Nature, Science and all. They hold the entire, you know, uh, 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 you know, all publication, and they charge hugely uh, from the sea. There are 3.5 lakh, you know, researchers in the country, and only nearly one third are associated with the institution. Right now, the access is available to only these many people. But, but through this mechanism, we will like that every citizen of 1.3 billion population of the country should get access. Uh, all, although we might need to pay some different amount. So uh, this is uh, uh, another, uh, the next chapter is the capacity development where we are going to set up a new framework for, uh, you know, uh, higher education institution excellence level. So already some excellence assessment is already done by the Ministry of HRD in terms of their performance. This is a, a, a different kind of assessment where the parameter will be research. Of course, the associated parameters will be, you know, contribution to the society and other things. So I'm not going to detail. In their industry, there is another concept where the science work for the society. Uh, science not just work for uh, you know, publishing papers in the impact factor journals and uh, have a high citation. But similarly, we are thinking of creating, a, you know, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, centers 
uh, in different institutions in the country which will work uh, at, the, uh, at the level of innovation rather than working just on the level of you know, uh, science. Uh, similarly, developing teaching learning centers in the uh, Similarly, you know, collaborative research center with, which will work with the MSME, startup and industry need to be created with uh, connecting the industry with the universities and, uh, and higher education system in STI research. R&D institutions, large number of R&D institutions are there in the country, especially if you could see that even science and technology, uh, Ministry of Science and Technology or Earth Sciences put together, sir, have more than 100 uh, institutions. Uh, I mean, 150 institutions, in fact, if I count uh, all the uh, autonomous institutions put together. What should be their role is they contribute to the, you know, also for the academic and research, uh, besides research activity. So they can get the integrated network and we can have a national uh, university system that connect all the autonomous institutions as the department uh, or the university. Also, there is a need to put in place professionally managed, uh, you know, equipment infrastructure. See, a lot number of uh, funding going for the infrastructure in the country, but that's not going for the utilization by the uh, researcher in every way. How do we create consolidation of those scenes and creating a network is an important thing. In the financing uh, part, you know, uh, we have so many recommendations where, you know, it is that the main concern that all of you must be knowing is that how do we create an ecosystem where A, that, you know, SNT, uh, you know, uh, uh, gets uh, penetrated into, into mini, uh, line ministries and the state government. Because state governments have not been able to participate in the R&D, uh, especially uh, science and technology, because science and technology being a central subject and the uh, state government participation has been minimal to the level of centrally, uh, central sector scheme. How do we convert that central sector scheme into uh, centrally sponsored scheme is a challenge and that we need to work. So there is a need for allocation of funds to the state level, state government as well as the, uh, you know, the line ministry. Uh, uh, similarly, MNCs have been not participating uh, in an organic uh, linkage with the Indian STI ecosystem. How do we promote them, incentivize them? They, uh, Indian industry become part of the MNC research is very important. Uh, incentivization, uh, this issue uh, came up very in a big way where we are targeting to increase the uh, R&D contribution uh, to 2% uh, of the GDP. Uh, we have been uh, always uh, thinking that, you know, government must pitch in and increase that uh, to 2% which is uh, actually, if you look at the uh, anybody, any country in the world, you find that although countries like US and UK and other have had uh, GDP contribution to SDRD, but that contribution comes largely from the private sector and not from the government sector. In India, the situation is zero. We, uh, R&D is largely contributed by the government. This, in order to reverse that, we need larger participation of the of the uh, of the uh, you know industry. What kind of incentivizations are required? And all those things are given. In this. Uh, so uh, this is all like you know how do we create trust between government and private? So this STI development bank ideas uh, that we create a corpus uh, which should stay outside government, outside the uh, uh, you know private and work for the long-term high-impact mission programs. GFR has been the one issue most of the ministries have been, you know, uh, kind of facing these challenges that GFRs come in their way of taking the large-scale uh, mission program forward in terms of maintaining the speed also, you know, uh, uh, you know, easing out the uh, the uh, their implementation. So all these things are also there. Uh, uh, 
Similarly, you know, in the research, we would like joint appointments uh, between uh, seamlessly happening within the industry, R&D, uh, academia, and government. Uh, I, I'm not going to detail, but this is the idea that it creates, uh, you know, an ecosystem where all three or four of them participate together. Uh, rural areas need to be integrated in the R&D with the mainstream R&D. Also, you know, we need to have uh, stakeholders uh, such as line ministry participating in the large R&D program. Uh, ease of doing our uh, research is very important. In fact, Honorable Prime Minister has been uh, emphasizing on this issue uh, uh, time and again. And well, there are many recommendations uh, related to this uh, on this. Uh, in the entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, we need to, uh, the, the policy focuses on the traditional knowledge system. And I think uh, there is a definition of traditional knowledge system. All the things it covers, I'm not going to detail, uh, but you know, all these need to be mainstream with the uh, R&D at the national level. Also, the grassroots innovation to be taken to a formal, uh, you know, uh, to be connected to the formal system of R&D and also taking that to the market level is a good challenge uh, that you see. Uh, uh, there is one good idea, it's, uh, in fact, this idea came from Secretary himself, that we must now bring, uh, you know, the distributed virtual incubators. We had into we did great job in DST in bringing the uh, creating the incubators, technology incubators, and connecting uh, developing a startup system. Now the did all these were done in the physical space. I think time has come to create virtual space and increase the number of startup ten times. Uh, technology development in indigenization again is a very important area where we are. You know, focusing both on indigenous technology development, but also on technology indigenization. And how do we promote these two systems is given in detail, you know, in this policy uh, by creating uh, an ecosystem where we can cut down uh, or reduce the technology import. We are dependent on uh, many countries in, in technology import. Uh, how do we create an art of Bharat? Why we becoming front line in the technology is the you know summary of this chapter in the BPA. Also, you know, there is one area where you know the private sector contribution has not been much, which was strategic technology development. The uh, you know institution like you know ISRO or uh, Atomic Energy or DRDO. Uh, have been largely working, uh, you know, within Denser or, or intramural. But now this idea of technology, strategic technology board uh, uh, concept where the strategic technology development fund can be established jointly with the private sector to develop technology in this is a large chunk of technology import that we do. And how do we reduce that? Uh, uh, and also spin-off technology to be used for, as, you know, startup. It is a very important chapter that is inclusion and uh, equity and inclusion. Uh, in India, in fact, if you look at global picture, globally 30% of the women participate in the R&D. But in India, the situation has improved so much. We have doubled the participation of women in the last six years. But still, out of 3.5 lakh researchers in the country, the women are only 56,000. That comes only 16% of the total. This number is not uh, up to the mark. We need to take this to 30% to be globally competitive and globally relevant in the equity and research. So this chapter focuses ways and means how do we achieve that. So there is a UK ways uh, you know, charter called Achina Son Charter. Uh, that, uh, and that is applicable in many countries like Australia and many others, they have implemented. How do we implement an Indian version of Achina Son for the country to 
to address some of the equity issues. That is the sector. In fact, GST has already initiated a, 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 a scheme, a, a program called GASI. That actually is an Indian version of the SNR song. But all these things are important. There are many issues, uh, age, ageism related issues are there. You see, uh, uh, leadership issue, women are, if you look at today, not a single IIT, right, not from now, right from the independence, is headed by a woman. Uh, so, you know, there are issues that need to be addressed. Leadership issue is very important. Uh, so, there are many, many issues related to that. I'm not going to detail. Along with the uh, gender, you know, the other issues like how do we create uh, traditional knowledge equity. We also create issues like you know, uh, the LGBTQ issues and also uh, issues related to Dimyangan's uh, issues. So there are many issues that are, you know, put as a part of the scene. Science communication is again an area which is, which is considered as one vertical. Science communication requires mainstreaming where every, uh, you know, institution should have a science communication wing. Uh, to create a mainstreaming of this uh, uh, thing instead of putting it as a vertical, there are a large number of this thing are there, including and uh, the new policy that DSP is bringing out on the social, scientific social responsibility is, is going to be a game changer in this thing, and therefore there is a, a reference of that thing. Also, we need to have more. Uh, penetrating into the villages and the rural areas and communicate science. So there we need a multiplier for the science communication. Science cannot be in the lab. Uh, it has to be going out to the public for this. International STI engagement, there are a good number of uh, things. I think in, uh, as Fifty mentioned, the engagement with diaspora is very important. We never did a very sincere job in bringing diaspora into the roughly, uh, if you look at the total NRIs in the uh, in the world, roughly three crore NRIs are there in the world. Uh, out of that, you know, the science and technology, uh, you know, uh, those who are contributing meaningfully and think very few laps. and that how do we bring them to formally and formally? In, especially in the context of Atmanisha Bharat uh, is very important. How do they continue it while they are in the, their places? That's called, you know, the uh, brain circulation is very important. Also, we have worked so much on the, uh, you know, SNT for diplomacy. But now, uh, we, along with the SNT for diplomacy, we need to work diplomacy for SNT. We have bilateral, uh, you know, agreement with 80, 82 countries in the world. I think we need to create bilateral with all, all possible <coughs> countries in the world. So we need to use diplomacy for SNT for that. Uh, I think uh, STI governance, we in fact propose two types of mechanism. Again, this is the uh, first time that the science is being thought about intersectoral, interministerial link linkage where apart from the science ministry, line ministry contribute and work together in the governance and in the collaboration with, uh, with science ministry. So the second issue is uh, interlink central state and interstate uh, mechanism, where the states participate uh, with them, with each other, and central state participate with each other. Also, this is uh, also uh, we need to have uh, NRF is being part, part, part of the NEP. How do we create linkage of, you know, the, the system in SNT with the NRF? How, what will be the role of NRF connecting the SNT ecosystem in the country? Uh, and also creating this research and innovation excellence framework uh, uh, is the issue that uh, it mentioned here. Uh, lateral entry of scientists uh, in the government, uh, already we have system like Niti IO is working on that. We need to have a policy as to how we gain lateral entry into the government, especially in the ministries. Uh, 
I think uh, we in this policy and STI policy institute is being proposed where it will function at all the three levels, metadata, advice and policy. All the three put together need a convergence and for that a national SMT uh, institute. Overall, there is a vision that we have given that we would like India to be among the top three scientific superpowers. Now, you may ask the question that already we are in third position in the, in, in, the, uh, in the number of publications, but what we are meaning here that in terms of all ecosystem, entire ecosystem we need, so not just in terms of education. And also we would like science to continue to people. Uh, uh, so there has to be a people-centric science and technology innovation ecosystem. Rather. Also the FT, this is the gray area of our country where the full-time equivalent researcher in India is one of the uh, you know, concerns for the country. We have just, the number is around 255 per million of population. That needs to be increased at least three times or at least two times in the next few years. Uh, that can be, that will be possible only when you increase the private, private sector participation and the overall GERD to, uh, to be made, uh, you know, at least close to 2% of the Also, you know, country must work at the, uh, uh, at the uh, at the excellence level of at the institution and individual to achieve the highest level of global recognition and award uh, for the community. Okay. Thank you very much. I think this is all. I'm sorry, I've taken longer time. Sharma ji, hai. Din se bhi puchna ho, aap ingit kar sakte. Aur main apne saathi usse nivedan karunga ki mic, do ki mic. Okay. Pehla prashn. Yes. And I also Nidhi. request that kindly introduce yourself, Nidhi. your name and organization. And Namaste, I'm Nidhi and I'm from India Science. So my question to you, sir, uh, Secretary, sir, is um, um, I need to stand and ask or is it okay? Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Akhilesh Gupta rightly mentioned about the uh, various verticals where this policy will be, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, collaborated with the other ministries. So I have a little longish question. Please permit me to ask that. So uh, this is, I'm talking of uncluttered intelligence for the ultimate blossoming of innovation and startups in India. What I have realized over a period of doing at least uh, over maybe 5,000 plus shows I realized that um, uh, I'm sorry uh, that uh, the impediment that comes in for most children who are very good innovators uh, is that uh, they're given a mammoth uh, uh, you know variety of subjects to uh, which kind of you know inhibits them to innovate and if uh, this is done. Uh, this is indeed a watershed moment. This is a fantastic policy uh, as we went through all the, uh, you know, rules and all the various trajectories and verticals that you're uh, trying to connect with. But my question is that how do you foster that innate spirit in a child who is made to do road learning? Some way innovation must take uh, the highest priority and some way, like if a child is interested in water, or he wants to innovate, uh, I'm talking of secondary school children on water, so maybe the CII can come forward with that virtual incubation, as you mentioned, because it somehow kills that spirit and then they are made to, you know, just study for either clearing IITs or MBBS, which is why children go abroad and uh, pursue these kind of innovative spirits. I had a student, somebody coming for my program who was doing something on drones, and before uh, you could say Jack Robinson, he was picked up by the Israeli ministry. So, just to put that short, uh, I'd like your comments, sir. All right. Um, so, so I'm, I'm so happy that you didn't only ask a question, but also posed uh, some of the problems and the possible solutions. Since consultation for the policy is going on, I think this is another aspect of any of us have any ideas, any suggestions that you would like to share with us, 
especially related to science communication, for example, that would be very helpful. Now, coming to this particular uh, issue that you said, suddenly education, the meaning of education is not to crack an exam and to get a degree. There is certainly necessary evil if you want to get a job, but it's much beyond that. It's much beyond that because it's a process of learning. It's a process, uh, the education basically empowers people for learning. And this aspect has become so critical as to we cannot imagine today sitting here as to how it is going to be in 20 years. Why has it become critical? Because if you look at, for example, new technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, industry 4.0, that are basically, it means that we have to compete uh, with uh, machines which may be good in certain aspects. Which means that there is a process of relearning which is going on all the time, reskilling which is needed. And there is indeed aspect of this policy through futuristic technologies. Which means what do we need to do today to prepare our people in a holistic way to deal with the future. To give you an example, um, and indeed there have been many, this, this is a multi-dimensional problem, so it is not a single approach to this problem. A lot of this is covered also in NEP, uh, so that this has been a focus of look, how do we give education, which is multidisciplinary, which is not very narrowly focused only on one aspect or other, uh, because it's true that during the school education, I would say even during PhD, uh, one cannot be a very narrowly defined being. So one has, while one has to get very good at certain uh, things, one also has to connect with the larger concerns of science and society. And the policy has uh, prescriptions in that direction because it is certainly true that uh, any technology mission, for example, that we start today, uh, it must be holistic in the sense that uh, it is also connecting all the way to school students because they will, we need to generate capacity uh, to understand, for example, artificial intelligence. So it starts from there. Then it goes college, you have to create human resources at different scale. You also pointed out where well, people go abroad. Uh, of course, there are, there's a different thing and then you have to create opportunity at every level uh, for people to do quality work here. To give you an example, uh, one of the things which are which have been largely missing uh, in our um, opportunity ecosystem is after PhD. So immediately after PhD and before finding a job, that's a very critical period. This is where if people don't find an opportunity, they would go abroad, and that's the worst time to lose them because they, you know, nation has already supported them through school, college and even PhD, so there's a lot of investment which is riding on that. And then the best of those brains which have performed well in research, at that point, might leave because they, they don't have uh, you know, a quality opportunity. So therefore, it's clear that one needs quality postdoctoral uh, programs, for example. And again, that's part of the policy. So point is that we have to look at where are the gaps in any of this, how do we have more innovation related programs in school, starting from school. To give you an example, some of you know about this program called Manak, which is now uh, scaling up. Uh, it started about two, three years ago, uh, but now it's scaling up numbers, which means uh, innovative ideas competition in schools. Uh, in any of the languages of the country, top two idea from each school reaching five lakh schools which means a million or 10 lakh ideas every year. And then rewarding those ideas, making prototypes out of them and competitions and so on, brings the, exactly the, the spread um, uh, that uh, Nidhi Kumarji you were talking about. Uh, you know, it's for people to understand the power of ideas, be excited by them, be inspired by them, and take it forward so when they grow up, they, you know, they may be uh, thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, becoming, uh, having a startup, uh, all of those things. Anyway, point is, this is a multi-dimensional problem. Um, and, and indeed, there are many, many different approaches in the policy that would actually converge uh, towards that ideal. You have a great idea that you have to 
Can I have mic? I have one more question, sir. May I ask? Can I have the mic? Can I have the mic here? Should I get up? So good afternoon. My name is Sanjay Agarwal. I have a portal, World News 24-7. And I've been covering a lot of things on science. Uh, so my question is, Dr. Akhilesh, uh, you're talking about the subscription for the research journals. So if you could elaborate, how it's going to work? Are you going to give subsidies over there? You know, because the people would object. Secondly, is about your bank. Because IDBI and SIDBI and all, they've not been performing well. So if you're getting into the banking for the STI, would it really work? Or would it be another, you know, mess, bureaucratic problem? Yeah, let me start with the first question. Uh, as I said, you know, right now, these suspicions are being uh, managed through the institutions supported by government and government institutions. Like, you know, in, in India has uh, something like 7,000 institutions in the country. Nearly 50% are uh, in government. So, uh, these institutions, they pay suspicion to the uh, publication houses. The amount, the rough estimate is 1500 crore annually. This comes so. But this uh, 1500 crore, what we spend, serves only few lakhs of researchers. So, first of all, is scope. How is it going to work? Isn't it? So what we have written in the policy is that uh, instead of uh, individual and institution paying for it, we will centrally negotiate the amount. Now, this amount might be lower or higher than what we are paying. It's not, the amount is not important because uh, it might be more than this. But what is most important is that you are serving only few lakhs of researchers, you will be able to provide free access to crores of people. I mean, even you can get that sufficient right. without any only thing, some procedure protocol only followed. Not that, so it is, uh, uh, not that, you know, if, how it is going to implement, you will not, so far, uh, not uh, contemplated. Uh, but idea is uh, made. And this has been debated extensively in our uh, thematic group also. But India will become the first country to do this, if this happens. Now, second issue is, you said, STI ban. So, STI bank idea uh, also is like, you know, the, uh, I think I mentioned that point, that the major problem uh, of mega programs which are being jointly implemented with the uh, industry is the, uh, the, the money transfer, the, the way the money is being released for the program and all, uh, have certain limitations and constraint to call of government, uh, you know, uh, system. What this STI bank will do, create a purpose, uh, which can be uh, through a uh, board, which will finalize this thing. In fact, uh, such a thing, and not exactly this way, but in, a, in the case of a national mission for uh, interdisciplinary cyber physical system, there is one such, uh, you know, mechanism already in place. How do we create a board and, and it's a mechanism which does not have to follow government rule, uh, you know, in a data industry. It's not that we are going out of the government, but it should follow, a, create an ease of, you know, implementation. So that is the idea. We haven't finalized, you know, implementation strategy for any of these implementation. There is a separate issue that we will do it. But ideas have been now brought out and even ideas for implementation have also been discussed. Thank you, sir. Hello, I am Jyoti Singh and I am from India Science Fire, Yankasar. Yes, yes, Sir, uh, the open access thing is a welcome move from the government side. 
but still there are so many questions like how uh, already you have answered but still if you could be more clearer on the road map of like how you are going to like implement that uh, negotiation you said so is it like how you are going to do or do that i want more clarity on that it is like you know a, a simple uh, i mean i will give example suppose you buy a microsoft office okay so all everybody is buying microsoft office or his pc or or laptop suppose there is a mechanism that we negotiate with microsoft and get central license for multiple use i mean institution do Single license, multiple use of one package. So it may be profitable to the company also. So we don't know how it will turn out to be. I mean, we are not as of now. We do not have clarity on that issue. So we will tell you frankly. But this is done. This is doable because even it is in the benefit of the company. Uh, Olisher, so they will say, okay, this much money is centrally being paid by government, and we are going to give access to all. That's very simple. So, would you like to clarify further elaborate? Yeah, no, no. I, I think, I think. You see, look, um, how how does it proceed? It, it proceeds by saying that we pool our resources. now india actually is rather unique in that sense because most of the scientific literature is being paid by the public sources by the government whether it's state government or central government which may not be true in other countries so if you look at us for example much of it is paid by what you would call private because even universities are all private right it's not the federal money which is directly going into all of these things So that gives you a muscle for negotiation, right? Because you have actually one place, one kitty, uh, from where all your money is coming from. So, so it's no point fragmenting that kitty first, and then having the little negotiations which are not very effective, because you know every college, if they were to negotiate, they cannot really negotiate. They are not negotiating from the position of uh, strength. so you understand the logic of this approach now uh, it's fairly clear uh, that that this negotiation of course how negotiation you know if it is any corporate negotiation then you know how it is done so the process of negotiation would be followed uh, and indeed i uh, haven't any doubt at all uh, that this would be something that would bring additional value to the country okay yes gentlemen you can ask sir Thank you. I'm Vicky Gore from the Chronicle. I have a few concerns. I wonder if you can enlighten us as to how this new policy would address these problems. The first is declining number of students taking science. Go across Delhi, science teaching is virtually disappeared from government schools. Even in public schools, there are very few students who take science. So, how does this new policy address? Interest, inculcate interest in science, and the other thing is even students who get about ninety-eight percent marks in ten plus two, they at the at the university level they prefer taking humanities, economics honors, commerce honors. Are there a lack of career opportunities in science? Is it because of this that these people switch over to the other streams, economics and commerce? The second thing is a mention was made about lack of leadership, women leadership in science. Especially IITs, AIMS, and other places. Is it because of the deliberate gender bias at the highest level, at the political level, at the bureaucratic level? Because I remember there are only a very few women who I can remember uh, heading science institutes. One is so there was a lady who was heading the National Brains uh, Research Centre, or two uh, women secretaries in the Department of Biotechnology, or one women scientist at ICMR. So is it at some kind of a deliberate gender bias at the highest level? And uh, Third thing is, you can only develop innovation, provided you give impetus to basic science. And uh, is there any way in which you are in, uh, tending to promote interest in basic sciences and opportunities in basic science? Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, so uh, it, let me first come to the gender question. In fact, this is so related to uh, the same question people also ask as to why there are not so many women grandmasters in chess. It actually is totally related question and I looked at it very deeply. Now, there are not so many chess grandmasters women because not so much because they, uh, they that their brain works in a different way or something. It's just because the pipeline going into before you become grandmaster, the number of women who take up playing chess very seriously uh, is much fewer. So the same number is reflected when you go to the top. Now, why is this question related? Uh, you gave two examples, let's say uh, in biotechnology and ICMR. Now it so happened that these are the areas which are rather well represented by women scientists. So if you look at medical profession, for example, you would see close to 50% women medical doctors. If you look at biosciences, you will similarly see that it's rather well represented in terms of women scientists. But now look at certain areas of technology like uh, mechanical engineering, what have you or mathematics or theoretical physics or high energy physics, there are certain areas in which there is a huge underrepresentation of women. And that becomes even more critical as you go to the top colleges like NIT, IIT and so on. Right? It's somewhere 10 to 20 percent in IITs, but that 20 percent is if you include sciences uh, and so on. But if you look at hardcore engineering, now what is the implication of it? The implication is if you have fewer women coming into pipeline, then you would produce fewer leadership, uh, you know, role models. So what basically, what happens is that there are cultural stereotypes, we say teachers, parents, everybody says, forget these areas, they are not for you. Have you seen anybody being successful in that area? Right, so it's a cultural issue. So the policy indeed holistically addresses all the issues that hamper the progress of women in science. Uh, one of them, uh, it's not a, I would not say it's a systemic bias uh, in government or anywhere of decision makers. In fact, you give the examples, let me also tell you that there are 25 institutions of DST. Uh, five years ago, they had zero director, uh, zero women directors. Today, there are five. So in five years, from zero to five out of 25 institutions is a huge change. And they are all doing fantastic. Now, they are the role models uh, for the next gen. They say, look, here is a very successful woman director, so, so therefore anybody uh, can do it. So those stereotypes start disappearing slowly. And policy indeed, uh, as I said, in a, in a holistic way, addresses, because there are, again, it's a multidimensional problem, we said culture. So people not taking to it, they will not succeed. Second aspect is the progression. So, as you progress, more and more of them drop out, for example, you know, they may relocate, may lose job because of family and stuff that happens. Also, our institutions have to be totally, uh, you know, on, on board uh, and that, that will happen. For example, just one example, that this is saying, look, that there would be a rating, ranking framework for gender uh, equality and inclusion. So, you have different parameters. Anything you cannot measure, People don't know whether they are making progress or they are not making progress or what uh, what, what uh, actions they need to take. So once you have this uh, framework for judging the progress, uh, not only for gender equality, but also for all the other critical factors. I mean, how do you judge how we are doing in research? How different institutions are doing in research? So you must have a framework and we are able to evaluate the progress on those parameters. Uh, and, and, and so certainly, uh, having uh, different, uh, you know, fellowships, etc., uh, for women, uh, but but the whole, uh, I mean, it's a slew of measures, not a single measure. Uh, so that certainly would address these very. Uh, um, I haven't any doubt that in five years we would see one third representation from women in the top technology colleges, which would then result in uh, the leadership which is visible to all. And inspiring for all. Palanji. Namaskar. Pala Bagla from Geo Frontiers of Science. Uh, question for Dr. Ashkosh. Uh, 
थैंक्स अ लॉट फॉर गिविंग अ न्यू पॉलिसी मच नीडेड को थोड़ा पास करना सिक्सटी थ्री पेजेस आई रेड थ्रू ऑल ऑफ इट अंडरस्टूड सम पार्ट फ्रॉम दिस माई वन क्वेश्चन एंड वन स्टेटमेंट देर इज दिस पार्ट वन पॉइंट सिक्स ऑन इंडियन जर्नल मच एज बीन स्पोकन अबाउट वन नेशन वन सब्सक्रिप्शन माई कंसर्न फॉर अ लॉन्ग टाइम हैज बीन इफ यू आर स्पेंडिंग फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड क्रोर्स ऑन जर्नल Why are we not bolstering our own journal and garnering five thousand crores from the world? Uh, now, I I don't see an emphatic emphasis in the in the policy about that. So that's my question. Uh, a small statement, sir. I uh, I think you are underestimating your capability. On. I think you are underestimating your capability by pitching yourself only at the third position. I think the last year of science has shown how we have been very different from the world and been able to deliver and save lives. I think you should be pitching much higher, and that is my suggestion. Uh, and one small point, sir, you need a one-page preamble to the policy. Sixty-three pages. If you expect any of the policy makers. Sitting in the old or the new Parliament building, trust me, it's not going to work. A single page, sharp, very good, well-written preamble, just like the preamble to the Constitution. You need it here, sir. You have three points at the end, but that's not sufficient up front. That's how it has to be. That's my small uh, advice. There are absolutely, I think, they are very good suggestions. uh and this is already known that you know a tight summary of the impactful things uh will be uh, prepared and presented uh it is already there but we need to fine tune it uh to make it more impactful and more really conveying what the essence is so that is very well done now okay number 3 yeah number 3 is present i i this is not the the what we call the final stop Uh, it's not the final stop. Uh, this is the interior measure of the life of the policy, um, and certainly our ambition can be higher than that. How many people here agree our ambition for next ten years should be higher than being number three in the world? There is your hand. Oh, wonderful! So you know, include that. <laughs> this is stakeholder consultation here. Okay. Uh, now your first point, which was more of a question. uh is about your own indian journals very good point this is a point which has been debated for no less than uh you know my age which is close to 60 now uh and suddenly a lot of efforts have been made in that direction and we have learned a lot from the fact that uh, not china not korea not japan not germany not france has been able to produce any of the top ranking scientific journals uh, in as many decades now this is not to say that india should not have make uh, you know very bold moves in that direction but there is something else that we need to do so um, uh, you know you have seen this uh, repository right an open uh, platform on which uh, you see that every work that we produce Uh, can in fact be cataloged there. Now, what I mean by catalog is go it goes a little bit more than being a repository, and this is in fact a very realistic solution. I'll tell you why. You see, uh, once I, I may publish my paper anywhere, but once it is published, I can put a, a print, not the not the published print, but another you know print uh, over there in the repository, but link it with the published uh, coordinates. so what it means is why is it that people need to read it in a particular journal they read it in a particular journal so they can cite it you know page number this and this volume number this and this and so on but the same thing you can read in any open access source and as long as you can link it with the published source then you read it here and then you know where it is published and you can cite it so basically all the intellectual property that we produce therefore becomes accessible to people without subscribing to that journal 
This is like having your own super journal, if you would. It's not journal of you know simply A B C X Y Z, but it's actually a sum total, an integrated total of all the knowledge which is being produced here. But one should not stop there only. Uh, now our ambition, in fact, should be to produce something which is you know you, you have like Scopus or Web of Science. So our ambition, in fact, should be even bigger than having five of your own journals. It should be a platform in which uh, the whole world actually comes in willingly. And they say, I would deposit my intellectual property here. Not intellectual property there, but I mean, uh, you know, all, all my research here. Because it provides access to the whole world, in a sense, for free. It also provides the tools of analysis of that knowledge. So just having something there is not very greatly useful. And you understand, like a scientist, anybody who has worked there, it should be totally searchable. It should have, it should be able to produce statistics. Should be able to do analysis. It should be able to draw out a collaboration tree. Whatever you know, analysis that you need to do on this database, it should be uh, developed under the same initiative. So therefore, there is some reason for scientists to actually come there. You see, if you don't make a platform attractive. If you simply say, ah, it's, everything is there, you do what you want with it, right, that, that is not very attractive. So our ambition, in fact, and on the similar lines, you would see we have ambitions of this kind which are best of the global ambitions. Uh, for example, map, okay, where, you know, our, uh, our satellite maps, uh, which we should be using for our navigation. So, uh, in all of these, the best of global platforms, which are digital today, this digital technology has to be totally leveraged uh, in order for our science to translate into action and empower us. And so these two examples I have given you. This, this easy, it's very easy to actually not understand what this repository is. It just looks like something, you know, it looks like this with something. Say, ha, kya hai, usme kya hoga? actually is far more ambitious uh, in its scope and its vision and in, in, in translation. It will go far beyond the five journals that we are thinking about today, whether Indian or XYZ country. Look, these boundaries of journals have totally disappeared in this world. So the, we, there has to be a new way of thinking about it, about empowering us with that knowledge. It, it, that line of argument 30 years ago made a lot of sense. And he said, I'm going to have my Indian journal. Remember, it has not succeeded anywhere. Okay, so now you need some very creative solutions for this problem, which actually would provide you even a broader solution, if you would, than what you're looking for in a single journal.